Chapter number sixty one of Ten Years Later. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Coos. Ten Years Later by Alexandra Dumont. Chapter sixty one The Storm. The dawn of the following day was dark and gloomy, and as every one knew that the promenade was down in the royal programme, every one's gaze, as his eyes were opened, was directed towards the sky. Just above the tops of the trees, a thick suffocating vapour seemed to remain suspended, with barely sufficient power to rise thirty feet above the ground under the influence of the sun's rays, which was scarcely visible as a faint spot of lesser darkness through the veil of heavy mist. No dew had fallen in the morning. The turf was dried up for want of moisture. The flowers withered. The birds sang less inspiringly than usual upon the boughs, which remained motionless as the limbs of corpses. The strange, confused, and animated murmurs, which seemed born and to exist in the virtue of the sun, that respiration of nature, which is unceasingly heard amidst all other sounds, could not be heard now, and never had the silence been so profound. The king had noticed the cheerless aspect of the heavens as he approached the window immediately upon rising. But, as all the necessary directions had been given respecting the promenade, and every preparation had been made accordingly, and as, which was far more imperious than anything else, Louis relied upon this promenade to satisfy the cravings of his imagination, and we will even already say the clamorous desires of his heart, the king unhesitatingly decided that the appearance of the heavens had nothing whatever to do with the matter, that the promenade was arranged, and that, whatever the state of the weather, the promenade should take place. Besides, there are certain terrestrial sovereigns who seem to have accorded them privileged existences, and there are certain times when it might almost be supposed that the expressed wish of an earthly monarch has its influence over the divine will. It was Virgil who observed of Augustus, Nocte plui tota reduent spectacula main. Louis attended mass as usual, but it was evident that his attention was somewhat distracted from the presence of the Creator by the remembrance of the creature. His mind was occupied during the service in reckoning more than once the number of minutes, then of seconds, which separated him from the blissful moment when the promenade would begin, that is to say, the moment when Madame would set out with her maids of honor. Besides, as a matter of course, everybody at the chateau was ignorant of the interview which had taken place between La Valliere and the King Montelet, perhaps with her usual chattering propensity might have been disposed to talk about it. But Montalais, on this occasion, was held in check by Malicorne, who had securely fastened on her pretty lips the golden padlock of mutual interest. As for Louis the Fourteenth, his happiness was so extreme that he had forgiven Madame, or nearly so, her little piece of malice of the previous evening. In fact, he had occasion to congratulate himself rather than to complain of it. 
had it not been for her ill-natured action he would not have received the letter from la valliere had it not been for the letter he would have had no interview and had it not been for the interview he would have remained undecided his heart was filled with too much happiness for any ill feeling to remain in it at that moment at the least instead therefore of knitting his brows into a frown when he perceived his sister-in-law louis resolved to receive her in a more friendly and gracious manner than usual but on one condition only that she would be ready to set out early such was the nature of louise's thoughts during mass which made him during the ceremony forget matters which in his character of most christian king and the eldest son of the church ought to have occupied his attention he returned to the chateau and as the promenade was fixed for midday and it was at present just ten o'clock he set to work desperately with colbert and leon but even while he worked louis went from the table to the window inasmuch as the window looked out upon madame's pavilion he could see madame fouquet in the courtyard to whom the courtiers since the favor shown towards him on the previous evening paid greater attention than ever the king instinctively on noticing fouquet turned towards colbert who was smiling and seemed full of benevolence and delight a state of feeling which had arisen from the very moment one of his secretaries had entered and handed him a pocket-book which he had put unopened into his pocket but as there was always something sinister at the bottom of any delight expressed by colbert louis preferred of the smiles of the two men that of fouquet he beckoned to the superintendent to come up and turning towards leon and colbert he said finish this matter place it on my desk and i will read it at my leisure and he left the room at the sign the king had made to him fouquet had hastened up the staircase while aramis who was with the superintendent quietly retired among the group of courtiers and disappeared without having been even observed by the king the king and fouquet met at the top of the staircase sire said fouquet remarking the gracious manner in which louis was about to receive him your majesty has overwhelmed me with kindness during the last few days it is not a youthful monarch but a being of higher order who reigns over france one whom pleasure happiness and love acknowledge as their master the king colored the compliment although flattering was not the less somewhat pointed louis conducted fouquet to a small room that divided his study from his sleeping apartment do you know why i summoned you said the king as he seated himself upon the edge of the window so as not to lose anything that might be passing in the gardens which fronted the opposite entrance to madame's pavilion no sire replied fouquet but i am sure for something agreeable if i am to judge from your mas majesty's gracious smile you are mistaken then i sire for i summoned you on the contrary to pick a quarrel with you with me sire yes and that a serious one your majesty alarms me and yet i was most confident in your justice and goodness do you know i am told monsieur fouquet that you are preparing a grand fete at vaux fouquet smiled as a sick man would do at the first shiver of a fever which has left him but returns again and that you have not invited me continued the king sire replied fouquet 
I have not even thought of the fact you speak of, and it was only yesterday evening that one of my friends, Fouquet laid a stress upon the word, was kind enough to make me think of it. Yet I saw you yesterday evening, Monsieur Fouquet, and you said nothing to me about it. How dared I hope that your majesty would so greatly descend from your own exalted station? As to honor my dwelling with your royal presence, excuse me, Monsieur Fouquet, you did not speak to me about your fête. I did not allude to the fête to your majesty, I repeat, in the first place, because nothing had been decided with regard to it, and secondly, because I feared a refusal. And something made you fear a refusal, Monsieur Fouquet. You see, I am determined to push you hard. The profound wish I had that your majesty should accept my invitation. Well, Monsieur Fouquet, nothing is easier, I perceive, than our coming to an understanding. Your wish is to invite me to your fat. My own is to be present at it. Invite me, and I will go. It is possible that your majesty will deign to accept, murmured the superintendent. Why, really, monsieur, said the king, laughing, I think I do more than accept. I rather fancy I am inviting myself. Your majesty overwhelms me with honor and delight, exclaimed Fouquet. But I shall be obliged to repeat what monsieur Viville said to your ancestor, Henry the Fourth. Domine num sum dignus. To which I reply, Monsieur Fouquet, that if you give a fete, I will go, whether I am invited or not. I thank your majesty deeply, said Fouquet, as he raised his head beneath his favor, which he was convinced would be his ruin. But how could your majesty have been informed of it? By a public rumor, Monsieur Fouquet, which says such wonderful things of yourself and the marvels of your house. Would you become proud, Monsieur Fouquet, if the king were to be jealous of you? I should be the happiest man in the world, sire, since the very day on which your majesty were to be jealous of Va, I should possess something worthy of being offered to you. Very well, Monsieur Fouquet, prepare your fat, and open the door of your house as wide as possible. It is for your majesty to fix the day. This day, month, then, has your majesty any further commands? Nothing, Monsieur Fouquet, except from the present moment, until then, to have you near me as much as possible. I have the honor to form one of your majesty's party for the promenade. Very good. Indeed, I am now setting out, for there are the ladies, I see, who are going to start. With this remark, the king, with all the eagerness, not only of a young man, but of a young man in love, withdrew from the window in order to take his gloves and cane, which his valet held ready for him. The neighing of the horses and the crunching of the wheels on the gravel of the courtyard could be distinctly heard. The king descended the stairs, and at the moment he appeared upon the flight of steps, Everyone stopped. The king walked straight up to the young queen. The queen mother, who was still suffering more than ever from the illness with which she was afflicted, did not wish to go out. Maria Theresa accompanied Madame in her carriage, and asked the king in what direction he wished the promenade to drive. The king, who had just seen La Valliere, 
still pale from the event of the previous evening, get into a carriage with three of her companions, told the queen that he had no preference, and wherever she would like to go, there would he be with her. The queen then desired that the outrider should proceed in the direction of Apremont. The outrider set off accordingly before the others. The king rode on horseback, and for a few minutes accompanied the carriage of the queen and madame. The weather had cleared up a little, but a kind of veil of dust, like a thick gauze, was still spread over the surface of the heavens, and the sun made every atom glisten with the circuit of its rays. The heat was stifling, but as the king did not seem to pay any attention to the appearance of the heavens, no one made himself uneasy about it, and the promenade, in obedience to the orders given by the queen, took its course in the direction of Apremont. The courtiers who followed were in the very highest spirits. It was evident that every one tried to forget, and to make others forget, the bitter discussions of the previous evening. Madame particularly was delightful. In fact, seeing the king at the door of her carriage, as she did not suppose he would be there for the queen's sake, she hoped that her prince had returned to her. Hardly, however, had they proceeded a quarter of a mile on the road when the king, with a gracious smile, saluted them and drew up his horse, leaving the queen's carriage to pass on, then that of the principal ladies of honor, and then all the others in succession who, seeing the king stop, wished in their turn to stop too. But the king made a sign to them to continue their progress. When La Valliere's carriage passed, the king approached it, saluted the ladies who were inside, and was a preparing to accompany the carriage containing the maids of honor, in the same way he had followed that in which Madame was, when suddenly the whole file of carriages stopped. It was probable that Madame, uneasy at the king having left her, had just given directions for the performance of this maneuver, the direction in which the promenade was to take place having been left up to her. The king, having sent to inquire what her object was in stopping the cavalcade, was informed in reply that she wished to walk. She most likely hoped that the king, who was following the carriages of the maids of honor on horseback, would not venture to follow the maids of honor themselves on foot. They had arrived in the middle of the forest. The promenade, in fact, was not ill-timed, especially for those who were dreamers or lovers. From the little open space where the halt had taken place, three beautiful long walks, shady and undulating, stretched out before them. These walks were covered with moss or with leaves that formed a carpet from the loom of nature and each walk had its horizon in the distance, consisting of about a hand-breadth of sky, apparent through the interlacing of the branches of the trees. At the end of almost every walk, evidently in great tribulation and uneasiness, the startled deer were seen hurrying to and fro, first stopping for a moment in the middle of the path, and then, raising their heads, they fled with the speed of an arrow, or bounded into the depths of the forest, where they disappeared from view. Now and then a rabbit of philosophical mien might be noticed quietly sitting upright, rubbing his muzzle with his four paws, and looking and inquiringly, as though wondering whether all these people were approaching in his direction, 
and who had just disturbed him in his meditations and his meal, were not followed by their dogs or had their gun under their arms. All alighted from their carriages as soon as they observed that the queen was doing so. Maria Theresa took the arm of one of her ladies of honor, and, with a side glance towards the king, who did not perceive that he was in the slightest degree the object of the queen's attention, entered the forest by the first path before her. Two of the outsiders preceded her majesty with long poles, which they used for the purpose of putting the branches of the trees aside, or removing the bushes that might impede her progress. As soon as Madame alighted, she found the Comte de Guiche at her side, who bowed and placed himself at her disposal. Monsieur, delighted with the bath of the two previous days, had announced his preference for the river, and, having given de Guiche leave of absence, remained at the chateau with the Chevalier de Lorraine and Menecamp. He was not in the slightest degree jealous. He had been looked for to no purpose among those present. But as Monsieur was a man who thought a great deal of himself, and usually added very little to the general pleasure, his absence was rather a subject of satisfaction than regret. Every one who had followed the example which the Queen and Madame had set, doing just as they pleased, according as chance or fancy influenced them. The King, we have already observed, remained near La Valliere, and throwing himself off his horse, at the moment the door of her carriage was opened. He offered her his hand to alight. Montelet and Tonnet Charente immediately drew back and kept at a distance, the former from calculated, the latter from natural motives. There was this difference, however, between the two, that the one had withdrawn from a wish to please the king, the other for a very opposite reason. During the last half hour, the weather had also undergone a change. The veil, which had been spread over the sky, as if driven by a blast of heated air, had become massed together in the western part of the heavens, and afterwards, as if driven by a current of air from the opposite direction, was now advancing slowly and heavily towards them. The approach of this storm could be felt, but as the king did not perceive it, no one thought it proper to do so. The promenade was therefore continued. Some of the company, with minds ill at ease on the subject, raised their eyes from time to time towards the sky. Others, even more timid still, walked about without wandering too far from the carriages, where they relied upon taking shelter in case the storm burst. The greater number of these, however, observing that the king fearlessly entered the wood with La Valliere, followed his majesty. The king, noticing this, took La Valliere's hand and led her to a lateral forest alley, where no one this time ventured to follow him. End of chapter 61, The Storm, recording by John Coos, www.validateyourlife.com and johncoos.com.